I have a question for you as we move into our time together. And you don't have to answer out loud. This is something I just want you to be thinking about. What are you moving towards in life? What is the thing that you get up in the morning and you go, this, this, is, this is why I'm living today? And what motivates you towards that purpose? So what, is, what are you moving towards and what motivates you towards it? What is that thing that you get up for morning after morning, week after week, month after month? Most of the time, if we, if we took the microphone and passed it around here and in the overflow, every one of us would share several different things that we are get up and we're motivated to live for. Most of the time, it's going to be for love. We're motivated and we get up in the morning for love. Maybe it's that special somebody. Maybe it's our spouse. Maybe it's our family, our kids, our grandkids, our spouse, our friends. We're motivated by that and we, because it's what we care about. Typically, what we're moved to is the things that we care about the most, and most of us would say it's the people we love. Some of us would say, well, I'm, I care about making a difference in this world, and I'm motivated to move towards that, making a difference. And maybe your career is, is something that God is using to do that, maybe help, helping others or volunteering. Those are the things that drive you, and that gives you fulfillment, and that's the things you're moving, moving towards. Or maybe it's it's uh, producing or building or accomplishing. Maybe your job or your business, um, helping things improve or getting better, you know, performing better, making a name for yourself. Those are the things that really drives you, and that's the reason you get up in the morning. Maybe it's happiness. It's comfort. Maybe it's some things like that, but it's the reason you get up. What really motivates us as a group of people? I came across a really interesting study Specifically, the study was about uh, companies and businesses with employees, and they were trying to figure out what is it that motivates employees to perform better and faster and get better results. And what they found was interesting, that the greatest motivators were not bonuses or work for the money. That's not what motivated these incentives, the carrot on the stick model, was not the greatest motivator for employees. Rather, what they found was the greatest incentive for employees to motivate them to do better and to perform faster were things like belonging, things like mastery. In other words, allowing myself to be a learner and grow in that area, purpose. Things that motivated and incentives were having a voice, being heard among all the employees. I have a voice and they're listening to some of the things I have to say. Becoming a part of something that matters was an incentive. And being a part of something bigger than yourself. When people feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves, that's actually an incentive to continue to move forward as an employee. That's interesting, but I don't think that that just stops on the business end, but that really applies to our lives as well, doesn't it? We are truly motivated by the fact that we can become a part of something bigger than ourselves, that our voice matters, and that we really can make a difference because of the part that we play in whatever it is that we're doing. And I love that, that we want to move forward in life, and we love to be a part of something significant. That truly motivates us as a group of people. That's true in the church. That's true in a family unit. That's true in business. I want to look at a part of our Christmas story now that we're in our Advent season, and I want to look at the lives of the wise men, and we're going to look in Matthew chapter 2. And I want, what I want us to do is look at the story through the lives of the wise men or the magi. What moved them? What motivated them to such commitment and passion to take this journey to find Jesus? That's what I want to do. And so I'm going to throw the text up here on the screen, and we're going to work through this together, and we're going to pause as we go through to look at the story according to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to start, we're going to go 1 through 6, and we're going to skip to 9 through 11. Here's what God's Word tells us. Matthew shares with us that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? You see, we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Let's pause there for a moment. We've come to worship him. Who were this, these, these magi or wise men? They had no doubt at all that there was a king, 
a very important king that was born in this area around Jerusalem. There was no doubt about it. In fact, they traveled a very long distance to come and find this king that was to be born. Now, when they got to Jerusalem, they assumed that everybody would have been just as excited as they were, and so they came asking, where is this king who was born? We saw his star, and we've come to worship him, and they get there, and they were surprised that everyone's response wasn't as dramatic as they had hoped it would be. But in their asking of the question of where is this king, it drew some attention, including King Herod. King Herod is the head honcho at this time. And by the way, he's not a great king because he was very, very uh, jealous of anybody else who had any power, and he would shut them out if there was any possibility they could overthrow his throne. In fact, he killed one of his own sons because he thought that, that his son was going to usurp his power and take the position. That's the kind of king we had here. So it drew some attention. And so verse 3 tells us this, that when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Well, why? Because... He was threatened by this this other king that was on the rise, right? And all of Jerusalem with him. Why all Jerusalem? Because when the king is disturbed, so is everybody else, right? That's just what happens. He probably made life a little bit anxious for everyone at that moment. Verse 4, Matthew tells us that he he called together all of the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. He wanted to find out where he was. Now, um, we are told that he told everybody he wanted to know so that he could come worship them. And so if we unwrap the story later on, he's like, hey, why don't you come back and tell me where he was so I can go worship him as well? Well, we know that that wasn't what he's going to do, right? He wanted to kill him because ain't nobody the king around here but me was King Herod's motto. And so he called them all to find out where it was, where this Messiah was to be born. In verse 5, they responded, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 9 says, After they had heard the king, they, the magi, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were, help me preach this, overjoyed. Now let's pause there for a moment before we continue. As I um, listen to some scholars talk about this star, some say that they followed the star in the beginning of their journey, but at some point when they got to Jerusalem, the star was no longer there because they said, hey, we've come. Where is he? Where is he? And when they realized they needed to go to Bethlehem, they needed to go south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, on their journey, they saw the star again. And they were so excited because they knew they were headed in the right direction. Verse 11 tells us this. As the Magi, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And what did they do? Help me preach this. Come on. They bowed down and worshipped him. It says that they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and of myrrh. They found what they were looking for. They finally found what they were looking for. I just totally botched that song, and it wasn't the right lyrics, but I thought I'd throw that in there. Anyway, I'll never do that again. Never do that again. Okay. Which led them to worship. All this time and energy, this journey led them to be on their knees before this Messiah, who was only a child. Now, I thought we would um, explore some misconceptions about the Magi, about the wise men. Misconception number one is there weren't just three Magi, three wise men. Many times we think, oh, it was three of them. Well, how do we know that? Well, my manger scene says so. Now, where do we get this idea that there was three wise men that showed up? Well, three gifts, that's right. Three gifts. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we say, oh, well, there was three guys. However, as we explore who these guys were, more than likely they had a very large group that traveled with them. This type of journey took a long time, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And because it took a long time, it took a lot of resources, and it took a lot of resources, it took a lot of people to carry those resources all the way to where they were going, and they, some even say they had a small army with them. 
So it was a large group. I mean, you'd need a group. These guys were wealthy, and these guys aren't going to cook their own breakfast, right? They're going to have a cook come with them and someone to do the dishes. And they're going to have somebody to pack the camels and the donkeys or whatever else. And would you hold my bag, sir, please? Yes, uh, for the next 10 miles. Thank you. Um, would you take this, um, this desert sand off my sandal, please? Yeah, would you shine my sandals for me? I mean, they, these guys were wealthy. They, they may have made on that. I don't know. I'm taking some liberties here. However, there was a large group to accomplish this amazing journey. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Dude, you're messing up my nativity scene. I have three there. Well, fear not. I found an Amazon link that will, you can order more wise men, okay? <laughs> Just text me, I'll send you this link, and you can order some more wise men to put around that. We're all good, okay? Thinking ahead for you. All right. Misconception number two. Most people think these wise men showed up at the stable, right there at the manger. How do we know that? My nativity team scene tells me so, right? <laughs> because you have the shepherd with the sheep holding the lantern, and like this. He's like this. That's the shepherd. And then you have the angel up there. You know, I think, I think they're like this, right? Uh, and the halo, and they're up, up on the top looking down. And then you have, you have Joseph, and he also has a lantern. There's a lot of lanterns back then. And he, I think he had a staff, depending on the one you get, and he's looking down like this. And then you have Mary. She's like this, and her head's always tilted, and she's kind of kneeling down next to baby Jesus, right? And then you have you have the oh-so-calm sheep and the donkey. And then you have the three wise men, and you have them all there. And so we think, oh, they showed up right there when Jesus was born. Actually, or a camel. What, yeah, you might have camels, too. But what we find is we actually read it. I don't know if you noticed, but Matthew in chapter 2, verse 11, says that the wise men visited and worshipped Jesus at the house after he was born, not at the stable. In fact, Jesus was probably anywhere between six months old to two years old, somewhere in that range when they came to visit him. Now I know what you're thinking. Dude, you just messed up my nativity scene again. <laughs> this one's an easy fix, okay? After you get that order in from Amazon, hopefully it's only two days in the holiday season, and then you have that big group of wise men hanging out, all you got to do is take them from the nativity scene and walk them and put them on the other side of the mantle because they're not there yet, okay? They're like, they're working their way there, and you can leave the star up there, because that's cool, that goes with what we're working with, uh, but just pretend like this distance is six to two years, six months to two years, okay? Will that work for you? If that's not close enough, put them in the kid's bedroom, I don't know, somewhere else, but they're not there yet, okay? And the next time someone, someone comes over, you go, hey, where's all the wise men? Oh, I got a story for you, check this out. Come here, let me show you. The 15 wise men, they're over here. <laughs> all right. The third misconception is they were kings. Where did we get that from? Well, there's a song that was written, We three kings from Orient far are bringing gifts. I forgot how it goes. And so it's a great song, wonderful song. The, the title in the first line, however, is what we find that's probably not accurate, but the rest of it is an amazing song. It actually unwraps and unfolds each gift and why it's important and how significant it is for Jesus. It's a great one. Look it up, listen to the lyrics, read the lyrics, it's great. However, they weren't kings. They were wise men. They were magi. Now, you're asking, what is a magi? Thank you for asking. Let me help you with that one. Hey, you're welcome, Dan. <laughs> magi was a name that was frequently given to, in that day, like a philosopher, men of learning. All right, these men occupied themselves day in and day out, mainly with knowledge of the secrets of, of nature and biology and astrology and medicine. They were professional learners, professional observers, and professional knowers. Some people, we know some professional knowers, right? They always like to tell you what they know. They're professional about it. Their vast knowledge put them in positions as advisors to kings, in fact, the text tells us that these magi were from the east. Now, it's really hard to actually identify what the text tells us. Are they from the east, as in the eastern region, or are they from east of Jerusalem? Most think they were east from Bethlehem, which some scholars say, you know, exactly where it's hard to tell, but they've taken some guesses. Some of them say they were from the east in a place, um, Arabia. Why Arabia? Well, that was east of Judea, and it was famous for gold, frankincense, and myrrh commodities. Okay, I, we could do that. Some scholars say that their interest in the stars suggests Babylon because they were well known for their astrologers. Others say that the writings say that they were called magi, which in the Greek 
is a term that refers to a kind of class of Persian priests. So they were from Persia. Let's just pick a place this morning. Let's pick Persia. Now, if they were from Persia, they would have traveled 1,350 miles. I have a little, this would there have been their foot route, potentially from Persia to Bethlehem. Now, if they traveled this route, this is 1,350 miles. They're going by foot, right? Because Uber wasn't invented yet. Maybe Lyft, but I'm not sure yet. If they went 10 miles per day, let's just give that average, and they traveled seven days a week, 10 miles a day, seven days a week, it would have taken them four and a half months to get there from Persia. Now, I would say that these men who brought their own cook probably paused for some Persian pancakes every once in a while and maybe didn't leave early in the morning or took a day off. Let's just say for argument's sake, maybe it took them six months to get there. What are we getting at? Basically, it took a really long time to go from wherever they were to go see this newborn king. But it would have taken planned and a calculated effort to travel with such a large group, with all those resources, to go that great distance. It would have taken a significant amount of money, as you can imagine, and these resources to take this journey. More than likely, we've mentioned, these men were probably rich. Now, how do we, why do we think they were rich? Because the gifts that they brought were no poor man's gift. Gold, frankincense, of myrrh, you have to have Gold to buy gold, right? Or whatever. Frank is, I mean, it's, so we can probably think that these guys were well-to-do. And they may have taken out of their own savings for this journey. We don't know. Maybe the nation that they represented say, hey, we want to we provide some funds for you because we want to also find out who this king is that you guys are all excited about. Years of planning, years of studying, the time away to go, the resources used, they were highly motivated to get where they were going, weren't they? These wise men really planned ahead. Now, guys, they put us to shame when it comes to gift buying. I don't know if you picked up on this, but it says that they brought with them the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That means that before they left, six months before they left, they bought a Christmas gift. I mean, that will put all of us to shame, right? Six months before. Now, some of you guys are like, some moms are like, nope, it was on sale. I bought it. It's in my closet. I mean, it's somewhere in the house, and it's coming out on Christmas. Well, that's great. But these guys, I mean, they, that was a pretty good deal six months ahead of time. Now, I mentioned these men were well-studied. We know that they were astronomers, astrologers, theologians. They studied the skies. They interpreted what they saw for information and for knowledge. More than likely, these magi knew the writings of the prophets from Scripture. The prophet Daniel, that includes a prophecy that gives somewhat of a timeline of the birth of the Messiah. And they keen in on that. They go, oh, hey, hey, there's something about this. Look at this. So that means that he'll be born around, okay, I think this is it. They studied these prophets. In fact, it's possible that the Magi had been aware of the prophecy of Balaam in Numbers 24, 17 that says this. It's not on the screen, but listen. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. They knew God's word. These men studied intensely. They went looking passionately, seeking and made great effort to find the answer that they had in the stars, the question that they had, and what they found was a beautiful surprise. They found this Messiah as a toddler, and they worshipped him. The bottom line for me is these guys were all in. That's what I read. That's what I see. All in. I mean, they took everything they had And they said, we're going to go find this. This is important. In other words, the miraculous Jesus motivated movement. The miraculous motivated movement. The same applies to you and me today. You will never lose when you move towards Jesus. Never. In fact, if you and I put as much effort into seeking God as these wise men did in search for Jesus, we would be so full of blessing so full of strength and purpose and worship, I mean, you could not put our fire out if we put the effort in that these guys did. My prayer is that this Christmas we do that, that the miraculous Jesus motivates us towards movement that's beyond what our world can handle. 
When we come into relationship with Jesus Christ, we meet the miraculous. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And you know what he does? He comes in our lives, he forgives us, and we just go, thank you, Lord, for that. He says, hey, your sins are as far as the east is from the west, and we say thank you for that. He says, and by the way, when I look at you, I see what Jesus has done. I don't see your sin anymore. And we go, oh, hallelujah, that's a good right on, amen, preach it, Lord Jesus, thank you, kind of thing. Jesus ignites a fire in us through that miraculous, through the Holy Spirit to serve him. And in our lives, the miraculous motivates movement. You see, you and I were meant for great things. When Jesus comes into our lives, it motivates us towards great things. Why? Because we serve a great God. But when I say that we're made for great things, I don't want you to misinterpret what I mean by that because when we say the word great according to the world, it looks a little bit different than what God looks at. See, great according to the world is popularity. Where are you going to do great things? I'm going to become popular. Everybody's going to know my name. Or maybe wealth. I'm going to do great things for God. That means I'm going to have pocketfuls of change and I'm going to use that to make a difference in the world. That's possible, but that's not the great things that we're called to. Or maybe I'm going to have a, a platform to, to use so my voice can be heard. Or, or you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to be at peak performance of my life in whatever area and career I'm in. Or maybe we seek the praise and we think that's a great thing. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say God calls us to great things because we serve a great God, it's not what the world says is great. It's great in the eyes of the Lord. And you know what great in the eyes of the Lord looks like? It looks like feeding the hungry, helping a neighbor, taking time off to go visit somebody who needs some encouragement. It means giving away something of value that you have, especially when no one's looking to say, wow, that was really cool that you did that. That is great in the eyes of God. When we spend time weekly meeting with somebody or calling them because they need some encouragement or some mentoring in the faith, when we do that in the eyes of God, those are the great things that God has us doing. And this great thing has a name. I'm going to call it a calling. Every one of us has a calling from God. Typically, the word calling is used for somebody who feels called to be a pastor, called to be a missionary, called away to do something like that. But I would say every one of us in this room, anybody listening who knows Jesus Christ, has a calling in their life. And it's to do great things for a great God. And remember, great is different in the eyes of the world than in God's eyes. Most of us have heard about the influence or the impact that Mother Teresa had in India. Her influence has really started with simple obedience to what God was doing in her heart. Simple obedience to what God was doing in her heart. If you know her story at all, this is just a reminder, but from 1931 to 1948, Mother Teresa taught at St. Mary's High School in Calcutta, India. But the suffering and the poverty she glimpsed outside the convent walls made such a deep impression on her that in 1948 she received permission from her superiors to leave the convent school and devote herself to working among the poorest of the poors in the slums of Calcutta. Simple, active obedience in her heart. And although she had no funds, she depended on divine providence, and God provided. She started an open-air school for the slum children instead of the, the children she taught at at the school. Soon she was joined by volunteer helpers, and financial support came afterwards made it possible for her to extend her scope in her work in Calcutta. And on October 7, 1950, Mother Teresa received permission from the Holy See to start her own order called the Missionaries of Charity, whose primary task was to love and care for those persons nobody was prepared to look after. And in 1965, this society became an international religious family by a decree of Pope Paul VI. A simple act of obedience is where it all started. That was her calling, of looking out the window and recognizing that something was tugging at her heart and obeying that calling. The influence that she has was world-reaching, yet it was a simple act of obedience. I believe that God is calling every one of us to one simple act of obedience at a time. 
And that when we come into the presence of God, that miraculous should motivate movement in our lives. I don't believe any Christian should be sitting on their hands and just say, well, we'll see what happens. But when God puts something in our hearts, a simple act of obedience is what we're called to do. This is a good time for every one of us to just pause and ask that question. Like, what is it that God is calling me towards? What is it that he's motivating and moving in me? And that would be the Holy Spirit, by the way speaking to me about what is it that he's asking me to do. If we're all called to great things, what is it that God is asking of you? Now, I'm just here to tell you, it's what what small, I'm here to tell you that it's an act of obedience. It's not a great grand plan that's going to start on Monday morning and it's going to require thousands of dollars and you're going to plug it in and it's going to go, oh, okay, that's not what I mean. It starts with a simple act of obedience. That's our calling. What is it that you need to follow through with that God has planted a seed in your heart to do? What is it that God keeps calling me towards? Now, some of us need to respond with, okay, Lord, I'll start that. Some of you have already started, but something about it, you begin to feel ill-equipped for the journey. Some of you go, I don't know if this is the right timing. I don't know if this is the right way to do it. I don't know if this is the right thing. Am I really, should I have waited? Should I have not? And let me just put that, if God has called you to one simple act of obedience and you've begun, then this for you is to motivate you to continue what God has already started. Don't doubt what the miraculous has already been moving you towards. Because I want to remind you, it's, it's one simple act of obedience at a time. How did Noah build the ark that God asked him to build? One, two by four at a time. How did Abraham go to a place that he had no clue? How did he move to another place from his home? One step at a time. And Moses, he was asked to go back to Egypt and help free God's people by talking to Pharaoh. How'd that happen? One word at a time through his brother. I like this quote that I'm going to show you from an evangelist named David Wilkerson. He says this. It should be on the screen for you to look at with me. When God calls you to something, he's not always calling you to succeed. He's calling you to obey. The success of the calling is up to him. The obedience is up to you. I think sometimes what we do is we go, well, if it's a calling from God, it's got to be, you know, I I can't see that happening out there. I mean, it's got to be big, and God can give us those visions of amazing, great things, but let's leave that up to him, and let's just focus one step at a time, one two by four at a time, one word at a time, one step at a time, following him, because that's our greatest move. Our greatest move is to pursue God and his purpose for us today, one step. Simple act of obedience at a time. Now, for some of you, this act of obedience might be to begin to work continually on your story before you help somebody with theirs. And that's okay. If God is doing a new thing in you, then one step at a time, trust him as he begins that healing process. And then when it's ready to move out and to help somebody else, it's one step at a time. Recognize that Jesus is the miraculous And he's calling every one of us through obedience. If you feel paralyzed this morning by that next step, if if you don't know quite sure, like, I don't know, should I take this step? Is this really it? I'm just wondering, Lord, could you make it clear to me what it is you want me to do? I just want to help you with this. I want to give you the words of Jesus. And Matthew records the words of Jesus in chapter 7 of his gospel, and he says this. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, help me preach it, come on, the door will be opened. Some of us, we just need to ask God, would you lead me? And he will lead you. He'll show you the way. Some of us need to seek God's healing and strength. Guess what he'll do? He will, he will restore you. Some of us need to knock on the door of our calling and say, Lord, show me the next step, and God will show you what that is. And it's one act of obedience at a time. We just need to follow. We just need to say, yes, Lord. 
See, we're all taking a journey together. Just like the wise men, I can imagine they were a part of something so big. They had this star that was leading them. There was this big entourage. They had all these resources, and they're headed to find this answer, and they're doing it together. They were a part of something bigger than themselves, which motivated them to find this newborn king. We are on a journey together. Especially as a church, we are a part of something bigger. We're a part of God's great kingdom here on earth. And we're on a journey towards Jesus, every one of us. And our calling allows us to be a part of what God is doing. Every one of us has that calling. And we join together. It's like we link arms and say, God has called me to do something. And I'm responding with, yes, Lord, one step at a time. Don't let the enemy deceive you that you don't have purpose. Don't let him deceive you. The reason I bring this message up towards the end of the year here in Christmas season is because sometimes at the end of the year, we look back at the year and we go, what was, what was that, you know? Like, did I really even do what I'm supposed to be doing? Is, is that, which is why the new year is always like, all right, we're going to do it this year, right? But as we look back over the year, let's not let the enemy have a foothold like, well, yeah, you didn't do what you should have been doing. God's been calling you to that this whole time. There's one step of obedience. You need to take that step. That's not what we're here to do. We're not here to shame or guilt. The Holy Spirit says, take that step. And so we go, okay, Lord, I will. Do not let him deceive you that you have no purpose. In Christ, every one of us has significance and value and purpose because we are all called according to what Christ has for us. So simply, the question is, what's your next step? What is that one act of obedience? Now, I want to help you with this one last challenge, this one step. Because we have a tendency to think, okay, my calling, my one act of obedience is, and we think it's just going to be one big thing. But you know what? It, it's, a, it's a simple step. And here's your homework for this week, and it can start today. When you get in the car to go home, when you maybe have lunch together or maybe later tonight, sometime this week, I want you to ask each other, so what's the thing that God is calling you to do? What do you think that God is calling you? What do you feel that God is calling you to do? And the answers are okay to say, I think I just need to call them. That's it. Or it could be, you know, I think that God wants me to explore what missionary service looks like in another country. It could be like that. But more than likely, it's, you know what, I think God is asking me to go and clean their gutter, because I know that she can't get up on a ladder, and she's by herself over there. You know, I think God is calling me to to maybe start giving towards this organization or or this person. I think I'm going to start calling that person every Tuesday afternoon. That's the kind of calling that God is one simple step of obedience at a time. And if God has given you a vision for something amazing for his kingdom, then share that. By the way, there is no wrong answers to the question, so what is God calling you to do? There's no wrong answers. And there's no, well, that was silly. Are you kidding me? Everything that God calls us to is amazing. And so listen, what is it? And this is from, from young to old. Young, young people, kids, teenagers, God wants to use you now. It's not like, well, someday when I'm 22 and when I, someday when I have that education. No, no, no. God uses you. In fact, one of the most precious ways that we see God move in his kingdom is through children and young people. And for those of you that are seasoned in life, you like that? God has still value and purpose for you. You're not, there's a lot of this going on and that going on. And, God can still use you. You think, well, I'm limited in my abilities. You still have some influence somewhere, and God is calling you to something, and so don't ever think, I'm too old to make a difference. You're not. What is it that God is calling you to? And let the Holy Spirit motivate you towards that movement because the miraculous is in our lives. Jesus is, and he's calling us to great things, and those great things in the eyes of God are beautiful And it's up to him to determine if they're great. In our eyes, they may seem insignificant, but in the Lord's eyes, they're not. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish this morning? Using the wise men to just encourage us and to motivate us to journey to the miraculous. I'm wondering if somebody here knows that they just need to take that step. And guys, again, it's it's a small step, and that's what God wants. It's okay. 
If it's a big one, then it's a big step. Some of you this morning are ready to say, you know what, Lord, yes, I'm going to obey. I'm going to move towards that calling. And if that's you this morning, if you know that God is asking of you something and, you're, and you need to take that step of obedience, then just raise your hand and say, that's me. I just want to be able to pray for you this morning. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be encouraged by the story of these wise men. God, may we also be men and women who are motivated to pursue you, motivated to respond to the calling in our lives. May we just obey. Father, thank you that it's one step at a time. You don't ask us to to jump over something that's impossible to jump over, but take a step towards it, and we'll leave the results to you, Lord. Those that raise their hand here in the room or maybe in their hearts, Lord, would you remind them that you're with them in this journey and that it might be a scary step, but you're with, you're going to help them as they move forward in that act of obedience. And Lord, may we all explore what it is you're calling us to. I thank you for the difference we can make for your kingdom's purpose. Lord, may your presence continue in our lives as we're molded into your image. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. Love you guys so much. Merry Christmas. See you next week. You are sent. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.